Before its economic reforms were called a miracle, before it stubbornly shut doors open to the wider world, before practically every single economic and quality of life metric shot up and to the right, China faced a crippling housing crisis. On the verge of a breathtaking rise, China, and especially urban China, was impossibly cramped. This is about the average footprint of a one-bedroom apartment in Manhattan, for example. This is about the average footprint of the average American kitchen. And in 1980, this was the average living space per capita for urban China. Not until 1985 would this cross the 10-meter barrier, and not until the mid-1990s would it cross 15. To put such density in perspective, these are the average living spaces for other urban areas the world over in 1992, with only the likes of Tokyo, New Delhi, and Cairo in the neighborhood of the average urban Chinese living space. Of course, available space only goes so far in quantifying a housing crisis. Not only was urban China cramped at the onset of the world's largest domestic rural to urban migration, it was also dingy, dangerous, and decidedly anti-modern. In 1985, 90% of urban households didn't have piped gas, 70% didn't have sole access to toilets, and nearly 40% relied on shared kitchens and shared water taps. Rapid demographic change was partly to blame for China's housing problems, and so too were corruption and general poverty. But fundamentally, there was simply no strong incentive to build. Through the 80s, housing in China was the responsibility of the state. More specifically, housing came in one of two ways. It was procured and managed by the local government housing administration, or it was provided by state-owned enterprises. No matter how you got it, it was cheap, too. Considered a right, rent cost only 1-3% to of average income, and these dues were not tethered to the cost of construction or maintenance. While ideologically coherent, this approach made additional housing construction a hard sell to central planners because unlike investing in infrastructure or heavy industry, housing would generate no substantial revenue. With the state at once obligated and uninterested, and private development outright illegal, China's housing was bad and only getting worse. Then came Deng Xiaoping, and with him, a real estate revolution. The Chinese decades-long development boom started with this a simple, single-sentence addition to Chapter 1, Article 10 of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China in 1988, that the right to the use of land may be transferred according to law. Vague and, in an era of economic reform and economic miracles easy to overlook, this line, justified in part by a series of smaller-scale pilot tests by the party, opened the floodgates. Unlike in freehold countries such as the US, all land in China is owned by the state, or in rural settings, collectives. This was the case before reform in the 1980s, and this is still the case today. But with reform came room for a host of middlemen. Now, the state still owned the land, but it granted smaller local and municipal governments the right to use land, to develop it how they saw fit. Local governments, in turn, looking to increase their own revenues for infrastructure projects or simply maintaining operations, could now sell these land use rights on to property developers who would then build out housing for a growing Chinese middle class that increasingly had the means to finance the purchase of a home at full cost. No longer was housing a need begrudgingly invested in by the state, but an opportunity. Local governments now had steady income streams through land sales, private developers had massive and growing demand to act on, and increasingly wealthy urban Chinese had increasing housing options and investment opportunities. Suddenly, what hadn't existed just years before, a private real estate and development sector, was red hot. Urban living space shot upward. So too did home ownership. From 1998 through 2002, Chinese developers built enough stock to house the entire population of the US. In the midst of an economic miracle, a housing miracle. Two things that couldn't be separated, as housing development didn't track alongside economic growth, but helped fuel it. According to the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institution's rankings, of the world's top 10 largest real estate companies by total assets, six are headquartered in either mainland China or in Hong Kong but doing much of their business in mainland China. Of these, four of the largest land development companies the world over were founded in the 1990s or later, making their rise from nothing to the world's biggest in a construction-based industry nothing less than meteoric. Certainly this rise can in part be explained by simply stepping in and filling an extreme void in supply, but it also has to do with strategy. Take the largest, for example. 
Evergrande's rise effectively began with this project, when a 110 square meter footprint, formerly the home of a pesticide plant, came up for sale in the High Zoo Industrial District. Turning the cheap land into aspirational apartments for a growing aspirational middle class, the project sold out in just two hours. Immediately, the company reinvested the earnings into 13 new projects across Guangzhou, and the push towards the top was unmistakably on. They weren't alone either, as uniform high-rises seemingly copied and pasted rose high into the sky around burgeoning cities and industrial areas. To the outside world, it was a boom. But considering Evergrande's business strategy, for those on the inside, it may have felt more like a race. To keep pace with competition, sky-high demand, and seemingly endless opportunity, Evergrande embraced a uniquely high-leverage strategy. Like any property developer, they'd fund construction through the combination of upfront buyer payments and borrowed money from banks, but the difference was just how much risk they'd tolerate. They didn't keep big cash reserves in case sales slowed down to make sure they'd make their bond payments. They didn't wait to see if one project proved profitable before taking on more debt for the next one. They truly just took on as much debt as possible and built as fast as possible, summing to an incredible amount of risk. But this risk was always rewarded because the projects always sold out. Growth was in hyperdrive as Evergrande went nationwide, breaking ground on hundreds of projects, then in the 2010s, nearing a thousand. As private developers built and built, housing prices only continued to rise while buyers continued to front down payments that, usually at 35% or more, dwarfed those of much of the rest of the developed world, signaling that the good times were only getting started. The impact was much broader than companies getting bigger, too. It offered a rare opportunity for the Chinese public to invest their money into an asset with a track record of consistent growth. It offered a major source of income to local governments, allowing for infrastructure development and social services. It created millions of jobs in one of the world's most active construction industries. What was once a crisis had now become a pillar of one of the world's mightiest economies. The only problem was, housing still wasn't doing a good job of actually housing. All those years of unimaginable growth inevitably led to unimaginable prices. Beijing's property prices per square foot were on par with Los Angeles's, Shenzhen's were about the same as Paris, and Shanghai's were nearly as high as London's. Yet, this was all in an economy where the average person earned somewhere between a fourth and sixth as much as those in the US, France, or UK. Globally, there are plenty of cities known for a fundamental mismatch between what people earn and what it costs to live there. In New York, for example, it takes 13 years of average income to pay for an average home. In Vancouver, meanwhile, it takes 16, while in London, an eye-popping 22. By 2018, in Shenzhen, though, it took 41 years of average income to buy an average house, a near-impossible proposition. And in Shanghai and Beijing, that ratio was only worse. But perhaps most concerningly, from the perspective of China's central government, this did not appear to be the simple result of high demand clashing with constrained supply. After all, supply was at an all-time high. Almost a quarter of the country's housing units sat empty. There were millions upon millions of completely habitable apartments bought and paid for, but never inhabited. It just simply did not make sense for a country to simultaneously have some of the highest housing development rates in the world, some of the highest price growth rates in the world, and some of the highest housing vacancy rates in the world. Unless, of course, one considers the rather clear conclusion. The value of housing had decoupled from its actual utility. It had become so attractive as a store of wealth that it was being traded based on its role as a financial asset rather than its role as a place to live. This is a familiar and growing phenomena across the wealthy world. Institutional investors are as involved in residential real estate as ever. But the extent of the issue in China was on another level. In 2018, a full 87% of home buyers already had another residence, indicating that, in a lot of cases, they were buying almost solely as an investment. From the perspective of the central government, this presented two issues. The first was the obvious. Skyrocketing prices made it increasingly difficult for everyone but the country's rich to find a place to live, which, as anywhere, has downstream effects in contracting labor supply even where it's in high demand. But the second issue was the more pressing one. The rapid expansion and vacancy rates demonstrated that the sales prices of property were stretching far beyond their intrinsic value. 
the prices weren't supported by the actual utility of the housing itself, and they weren't even supported by constrained supply. Rather, they were almost fully supported by the belief that prices would only continue to rise further. That's to say, the housing market had formed into a bubble. So, to avoid letting it burst on its own, the only question was when and how to pop it. The answer was August 2020. Then, the central government rolled out three red lines. Three rules the property sector would have to follow or else face severe growth restrictions. Each was about reining in financial risk. First, developers couldn't have more in liabilities than 70% of the value of the assets the company itself owns. Second, developers couldn't owe more in debt than the totality of what the company itself is worth in equity. And third, developers couldn't owe more in short-term debt than what it has in cash at a given moment. Even if a developer did not violate any of the red lines, they'd be capped at 15% year-over-year growth in debt, while if they violated one, the cap would be 10%, two, 5%, and if they violated all three red lines, they couldn't grow their debt obligations at all. But these three red lines were far from a theoretical threat. Evergrande, after all, had a debt-to-liability ratio of 81% and a cash-to-short-term debt ratio of 67%. They were overleveraged and short on cash, meaning they violated two red lines. And their net debt to equity ratio was 99.8%, just a hair's breadth from the third red line. And thus, their cycles started to break. Evergrande had millions upon millions of apartments already sold to buyers, yet not completed. To pay builders and suppliers and others to complete these projects, they had to borrow more, yet faced with new restrictions due to their violation of the two red lines, they just simply couldn't. So their cash reserves dwindled, their existing obligations remained the same, yet they had little ability to reverse course by launching new projects. And even if they could, the market had changed. China was both the first and last major economy with significant COVID restrictions. As much as the rest of the world regained a sense of normality, China elected to vaccinate its population with generally less effective, domestic-made traditional vaccines, as opposed to the more effective, novel mRNA-based jabs used elsewhere. So to quell the various outbreaks that still arose after widespread vaccination, the country maintained far stricter COVID policies than the rest of the world. Overall, economic productivity declined, and therefore the entire economy and each individual's finances took a disproportionate hit. Simultaneously, the country's migrant worker class reversed course. Individuals who had previously moved from their rural hometowns to cities, seeking brighter economic prospects, returned home. During the pandemic, for the first time in recent history, the quantity of migrant workers in cities declined. While this was accelerated by lower demand for labor in cities during the pandemic, many also pointed to the high cost of housing as why the higher salaries in cities were no longer worth it. And finally, decades of demographic change were catching up with the nation. The steady decades-long decline in birth rates meant those in China's notably young core home buying age, centered at 29 years old, were beginning to represent a smaller and smaller fraction of the overall population. Even if the overall population stayed steady, for the moment at least, the proportion likely to buy a home had begun to shrink. So Evergrande not only was prevented from taking on debt, it was also starting to struggle to generate money through additional sales of new projects. The two key money-generating stages in the cycle just were not working like they used to. But they still had debt to pay off and apartments to finish, so backed into a corner, the company started rummaging for cash. Rather inexplicably, in 2018 it had established an electric vehicle manufacturing division that itself, perhaps even more inexplicably, included a major senior care division, but in 2021 it courted Xiaomi to see if they would buy a majority stake. Talks eventually stalled and no sale was made. It also reportedly courted buyers for its stake in the championship-winning Guangzhou FC soccer club, but considering Evergrande was losing millions of millions of dollars a year through that ownership, it also failed to sell. It was able to sell off its 18% stake in an entertainment joint venture with Tencent for $273 million, but this was ultimately a drop in the bucket compared to what the company needed to right the ship. So ultimately, the death spiral began on Monday, December 6, 2021, not with a bang and not even with a whimper, but rather with just simply nothing. That day marked the end of a grace period for already late payments on a set of bonds, but it came and went without payment or even an explanation of when payment might come. 
Then Tuesday passed with nothing more, and Wednesday, and by Thursday, with investors still unpaid, Fitch Ratings, one of the world's big three credit rating agencies, declared Evergrande in default. This was effectively the official, although largely ceremonial, signal to the financial world that they should not lend money to Evergrande because they might not get it back. As a property developer, a business model almost entirely centered around debt, default is pretty close to the end of the line. Even if the company could get loans, they'd be at such a high interest rate to offset the risks of the lender that the effective cost of property development would be uncompetitive relative to the market. In fact, Evergrande did have an easier time than the average company in such a dire situation finding lenders, since many believed the company was too big to fail, such an instrumental part of the Chinese economy that the CCP would bail it out to avoid an economic crisis. But that bailout never came. After a year or two sputtering along, restructuring debt, shedding off assets, cost-cutting, in January 2024, a court in Hong Kong determined that it was just simply impossible. Evergrande could not be saved, the cycle could not be restarted, and the only option was to strip it for parts and make creditors as whole as possible. But the crux of China's challenge is that this isn't just an Evergrande issue. While it was the largest, most dramatic example highlighted in international media, the forces that slayed the giant are putting pressure on almost every single property developer. Country Garden, another giant, appears just months behind Evergrande and after years on life support is teetering towards liquidation. Dozens of other developers are in default, and over $100 billion of debt payments from the Chinese property sector have failed to get paid. There are quite a number of forces putting pressure on the Chinese economy their demographic shift, their deindustrialization, their increasing insularity, but the way the property sector has weaved itself so integrally through the nation means it serves to magnify every single one of those issues. At base, the fact that the sector accounts for an outsized portion of its gross domestic product means it simultaneously can account for an outsized drag on gross domestic product. But it also has a propensity for negatively impacting the demographics of people most central to China's economy. Stock market crashes, for example, have an impact on all, but impact those who have a higher portion of their income in the stock market most, which tends to be wealthier individuals and institutions. The Chinese property sector, however, is a key source of savings and investment for the nation's middle class. This demographic is the one most likely to have an outsized portion of their net worth tied up in a single Evergrande apartment that might now never exist. Money has just simply disappeared, and there's a gaping hole in the middle of the Chinese economy. The Chinese property sector was always going to collapse. Its highly leveraged debt-fueled foundation was never strong enough to support itself in anything but the most gangbusters periods of growth. It was fundamentally flawed from the get-go, so some sort of crisis always had to happen. So what's happening in the Chinese economy is essentially a controlled demolition. But this does represent a uniquely tenuous position for the central government. The Chinese social contract, unsaid but always understood, is that individuals sacrifice personal liberty in exchange for common economic prosperity. While dissent of course appears, since nobody truly gets a choice whether to make that trade-off, a huge portion of the population wholeheartedly believes in this social contract. After all, it's hard to argue with the means when the end is 800 million people lifted out of poverty. But that's now history. If Xi Jinping can't deliver his end of the bargain, if the common economic prosperity wanes, then the question in everyone's minds is why they should have to deliver theirs. Think about how much time you spend in a day waiting. For a meeting to start, for the bus, for the laundry to finish. You, like anyone, probably fill up that time by scrolling Twitter or TikTok or Instagram, but I don't know many people who feel better after scrolling through a social media site. I think it's worth filling up that interstitial time with something that does leave you feeling better, and if you're the average Wendover viewer, for you that probably means some sort of learning. Of course, it's tough to fit learning into those small pockets of the day, but that's why I recommend our sponsor, Brilliant.org, so much. They're a STEM learning platform that has taken these big, daunting subjects like calculus or applied probability or neural networks and broken them down into bite-sized chunks. Not only that, but they have a unique teaching style that focuses on teaching intuitive principles first then pulling them together into the bigger concepts. As someone who always struggled in school with STEM subjects, I find that Brilliant.org really makes these previously inaccessible topics approachable, which I find amazing considering how daunting some of them seem. 
and with their mobile app, you can start a course on your computer, then finish it on the bus. I'd especially recommend their new course on how large language models work. We hear so much about things like ChatGPT now, so I found it fascinating to finally understand how these actually work, and if anything, I was surprised how simple the concept behind it actually is. So if you want to fit more learning into your life, you can try everything they have to offer for free for a full 30 days. Just visit brilliant.org slash Wendover or click the link in the description and you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.